Here it's my pleasure to introduce Sherry Abbott, who's Vice President for Sustainability Initiatives and University Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Syracuse University. Uh, before coming to Syracuse University, Sherry uh, served in a, in a number of roles in, uh, in Washington, including at the National Academies and most recently in the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, where she was Associate Director for Environment, including responsibilities of representing the United States at the meetings of the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Sherry Abbott. Thanks, Ed. That's a, um, it's a pleasure to be here. The, the 15th symposium, this is my first, this is my fifth uh, welcoming, so I feel kind of like an old timer here. <laughs> it's really quite funny. I'm really glad that Dean uh, Dahlberg is able to be with us today. I wish there were a few more students in the room. Uh, probably later in the day, my students had something due at midnight last night, so I think they're probably still slumbering, but hopefully they'll be here. More, more students will, will be with us later on. Uh, many of you know that Syracuse COE's network has proven capabilities for large-scale projects that integrate research development, demonstration, and deployment. We have successfully connected our universities to companies to spur innovations and companies to markets to accelerate deployment. One of the critical relationships that the Syracuse COE has is with the New York State Research and Development Authority, better known as NYSERDA. Uh, as a member of the NYSERDA board, I really understand the, the important work that needs to be done to catalyze the partnerships that are going to be required to move us closer to a clean energy uh, future and uh, moving markets, and NYSERDA is involved in this. Um, borrowing from a famous General Motors advertisement about Oldsmobile, this is not your father's NYSERDA. Uh, shifting toward a clean energy co economy is a daunting task for the state, even with a committed leader like Governor Cuomo and his energy team led by Richard Kaufman. It will require a bit of leaning in by all of us, because just as NYSERDA is not your father's, climate change shouldn't be your children's and your grandchildren's problem to solve. With that, it's my pleasure to inter introduce and welcome Janet Joseph to give you some insights into the energy and climate solutions uh, that NYSERDA and the state are involved in. Over the past 24 years at NYSERDA, she has led technical policy and leadership positions. Currently, she serves as the Vice President for Innovation and Strategy, overseeing research and market development programs. In her tenure, she spearheaded initiatives to develop renewable power in New York, build a clean tech startup industry, and identify greenhouse gas reduction strategies that provide benefits for New Yorkers. Prior to joining NYSERDA, she, she was a research scientist at the Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratory, and in addition to serving on several boards, she received the 215 Public Service Excellence Award from the State Academy of Public Administration. She holds a master's degree in environmental chemistry from the University of Maryland, a little bit closer to my neck of the woods. I'm delighted that she's agreed to be here with us today. Please welcome Janet Joseph. <laughs> Okay, well, well, good morning. Sherry, thank you for the introduction. Ed, Dean, welcome to, to upstate New York, uh, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. So what I will try to do this morning is to share with you our vision for a clean energy future in New York State. As Sherry said, New York is embarking on a transformation of its energy policies and its programs in New York State. Our goal is to create a cleaner, a more affordable, and a resilient energy system that all New Yorkers can access. Now, why a transformation? Why now? New York has some big energy challenges, and big energy challenges require bold action. And that is really what we are endeavoring to do in New York State. So what are our challenges? Well, we have persistently high energy costs in New York State. 
we have a need to invest more substantially in our electric distribution system. As we look over the past decade, we've spent about $17 billion in upgrading and simply maintaining our electric power distribution system. As we look out to the next decade, we'll need at least $30 billion to do that. Um, so if we're concerned about energy costs when we look to the future, you know, our concerns, our concerns go up. We have low capacity utilization in our electric power distribution system, about a 54% capacity wow. utilization. So what that means is that our electric power system is designed and built to meet 100 hours of the year that have peak demand. So that's kind of analogous to building roads in New York State that are designed to meet 100 hours around Christmas break. If we did that, we'd spend an awful lot of money in roads. We've ha we'd have a lot of roads that are empty for the other 8,600 hours a year. So we have to do something about that. Other capital intensive industries have figured out how to get their capacity utilization to you know, closer to 80%, if not, if not higher. We should be able to do that in our energy distribution system. Now, we also have increasingly frequent extreme weather events. And we have no reason to believe that that is going to abate in the near future. We need to have an energy system that's resilient and prepared to handle these events. And last, but certainly not least, we need to lower our greenhouse gas footprint in our energy system in New York State. So that is an economic imperative, that is a social imperative, and that is an environmental imperative. So these are the reasons why we are embarking upon an energy transformation in New York State, a transformation of our policies and a transformation of our programs. So with that background in mind, New York has established a reformed energy vision, which we call REV. Now, REV is New York's comprehensive strategy to enable a self-sustaining clean energy marketplace that can, again, support this cleaner, more resilient, more affordable energy system. There are three pillars to REV that are shown in this sli slide here. The first is groundbreaking electric utility regulatory reform. And through this effort, we are trying to remake our utility system to meet the challenges of the future. We're trying to move our utility system to a more distributed energy platform, an energy system that could handle more and more cleaner renewable resources, a system that accommodates 21st century innovations in, in IT and controls and visualization, uh, a system that provides consumers with energy options where they choose to pursue those energy options. So this is a very intensive effort that our Public Service Commission in New York State is, is leading, and there are literally thousands of stakeholders engaged in, in these deliberations, and many of you may be uh, participating to one degree or another. The second pillar of our reformed energy vision is the evolution of clean energy programs in New York State, including NYSERDA's programs. So that includes our Clean Energy Fund initiative, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. It includes uh, initiatives such as New York Prize, which is a community microgrid demonstration and our efforts to reform the way we are approaching and incentivizing large-scale renewables. 
The third pillar of our reformed energy vision is a leading by example initiative. And that's certainly something that I think our, our colleges and universities um, across the country uh, do well. You know, in part, your student body kind of demands it. But, but this can create great exemplars for the rest of our, our society. So we are trying to use our state's energy assets and building assets to drive clean energy markets, to lower our greenhouse gas footprint, to demonstrate new and innovative technology so we can accelerate this transformation that we seek to, to achieve. Now, the state energy plan, uh, which was published in June of this year, has presented goals and initiatives to address our energy challenges and to, to drive us toward this clean energy future, and they're shown in, in this slide. We've established a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in New York State 40% by 2030, so that puts us on this trajectory to reduce emissions to, toward that 20, 2050 goal of, of 80%. We seek to remake our electric generation mix in New York State such that half of it by 2030 comes from renewable resources. And this is a big, significant goal. We're at about 25% now, so we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. And we seek to reduce the overall energy consumption in New York State by about 23% um, by the year 2030. So this, again, is a, a fairly significant effort, and we will need uh, innovations such as those that are being advanced here to, to help us do that. So now what I'd like to do is focus um, a little bit more on the Clean Energy Fund initiative. This is something that NYSERDA is intensely involved in. So in June of this year, we submitted a proposal to our Public Service Commission to remake our energy programs in New York State and create one clean energy fund. This proposal was a 10 10-year, $5 billion proposal. Uh, the Public Service Commission and stakeholders are deliberating on this proposal uh, as we speak. We, we hope to have a decision by the end of, of this year. Now, the Clean Energy Fund is been, has been designed really to stimulate and drive demand in clean energy as part of our reformed energy vision, it, as a way to help us achieve our ambitious state energy goals. And there are four primary portfolios in the Clean Energy Fund. The first one is a market development initiative, which is about half of this Clean Energy Fund. And again, that's really focused on stimulating consumer markets and building supply chains for clean energy. There's a major solar initiative through New York Sun. There's an R&D component, which really builds on our historical learnings in R&D at NYSERDA. And there is a clean energy finance initiative. And I'll walk through uh, these in a little bit more detail. So starting first with our market development program, one of the fundamental premises of the Clean Energy Fund is that we need to drive scale. We need to drive scale. So government-funded programs alone will not get us to the level of greenhouse gas reductions that we need in New York State, that we need across the country, that we need globally. Um, so we have to figure out how to mobilize private investment, how to engage communities, how to engage our institutions in, in New York State. So our market development program um, is providing 
assistance, support, facilitation to the commercial sector, the industrial sector, residential, and multifamily. We're focusing here on commercially available clean energy technology. And we're trying to get that technology into the marketplace. We're looking at behind the meter technology here. So this is not large scale renewables. We're looking at energy efficiency, distributed generation, renewable heating and cooling. This is an important new initiative in New York State. And again, probably one that would resonate with, with the center. We've been focusing a lot of energy on renewable electricity. We've got to figure out how to heat our home and cool our homes and our businesses in a low greenhouse gas manner. Um, and then there's some large scale renewable resource market development. Now, Sherry mentioned that we're remaking our, our programs and our strategies. We are reframing our approaches to clean energy to move away from a primary focus on offsetting first cost barriers. So we know with some of these technologies, first cost is an issue, and we will have to address those. But if there are other barriers that are presenting adoption, we could put all we want into first cost, and adoption won't increase. So that's when we talk about we're remaking our portfolio. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at the major barriers that are preventing commercially available clean energy technologies and energy efficiency from working their way into the market. So if customers have concern that the technology or the installation won't perform, it, it doesn't matter how much first cost reduction we do. If there's a lack of solution providers in the marketplace, we need to address that. If, the high, if soft costs are high, installation costs, for example, we need to address that. And if consumers want to spend less time in making an energy purchase decision, we've got to work the way they want to work. You know, not everybody is an energy geek that gets all excited about looking at an energy audit and spending hours trying to understand what they should do. We've got to work with consumers the way they want to make decisions. And that's what we are trying to do with this market development portfolio. So it's an evolution of our deployment strategies. We're, we're very cognizant of where we need to reduce first cost, but we have to address the other market barriers to energy efficiency and clean energy adoption as well. Now, the Clean Energy Fund includes a major solar initiative. This is a billion dollar initiative, New York Sun. What we're trying to do here is develop a scalable, sustainable, subsidy free, emphasis on subsidy free, solar industry by 2023. And we're making really good progress on this again, as, as we speak. So this program has a, decline, a predictable, transparent, declining incentive structure. Um, and I think those are the two, well, probably three important descriptors. The marketplace knows what it is because we've laid out our trajectory for 10 years. It's very transparent. And the incentive level is going down. And the market knows it, and they have to work toward it. So we expect to be subsidy free by 2023. Uh, and in some regions of the state where the economics are favorable, we will be out of the electric rate payer subsidy business within just a few months, six months, I suspect. Areas, for example, Long Island, where there's high electric costs, uh, the PV systems don't need the rate payer subsidy. Um, so this industry is moving uh, intensely. Uh, we have more than several hundred installers active in New York State. The cost for solar has dropped 50% over the past five years, and we see future cost reductions on the horizon. So this industry is really turning from a cottage industry to a real bona fide component of our economy. The next element of the Clean Energy Fund is a financing initiative, which we call the New York 
Green Bank. This is another billion dollar initiative that has created a specialty finance entity that's working in partnership with the private sector to increase and mobilize capital to support clean energy projects. Now here too, we're focusing on marketing barriers and financing gaps. We are not in this, in this area turning into a retail bank. So we're not providing loans to consumers, low interest subsidized loans. What we're trying to do is to get other financial entities into the clean energy marketplace. So if they're not comfortable with a particular asset class, such as energy efficiency, we'll provide some risk guarantees to get them comfortable with making energy efficiency investments such that we can get out of the business and they can get into the business. So that's an example of the kinds of models that we want to support and accelerate through the, through the Green Bank. And again, we expect to mobilize a substantial amount of private capital through this on the order of $8 of private capital to every $1 of public capital that we put into this, this effort. The uh, third or fourth component of the Clean Energy Fund is our innovation and research activity. And this is probably, you know, th this is, I should say, the long-standing root of, of NYSERDA and why NYSERDA was, was created now 40 years ago. So there are two major components to the innovation and research work that we have proposed as part of the Clean Energy Fund. There is an environmental research component that's designed to help inform policymakers and identify strategies to reduce the environmental impacts from energy uh, production and use. And we've done a lot of really good work over the years with Syracuse University in this environmental area, and I expect we will continue to have such collaborations in the future. Um, as the Clean Energy Fund goes, the environmental research component is a very small component, but, but I always say it's small but quite significant. Um, the, the second piece is our technology and business innovation in, in investments. And this is about 60, 70 million dollars a year worth of investments. And what we seek to do here is to catalyze valuable innovations that will create low greenhouse gas solutions for New York. And perhaps equally important, is to create a vibrant clean energy industry in New York. And we really do believe that New York has some tremendous innovation assets and manufacturing capability and know-how that we can capitalize in New York to help this industry continue to grow. There are five areas that we will be focusing on in our R&D portfolio going forward, and I've identified these here. Um, I won't go through them all for the sake of time, but I'd be glad to talk uh, with any of you about these in, in more detail. Uh, distributed energy resource integration is a very important part of our portfolio going forward. It really is a critical part of achieving our REV vision. You know, our REV vision has a much more distributed energy system, so we need to integrate these distributed generation resources into our, into our electric system. We need to have visibility, we need to support aggregation, we need to be able to facilitate control. And there's a good amount of technology work that needs to happen to, to, to make that work smoothly and efficiently. Renewable energy optimization, we still need to drive down the cost of renewable energy. There's no, no doubt about that. Advanced buildings innovation, again, an, import, an area that's very significant to, to this center and one where we see still much work needs to be advanced. In the future, um, and we do have our, our team leader for our advanced buildings program here, Joe Borowick, so I, I know he'll be here for the balance of today. Uh, we will be focusing on 
advanced heating and cooling technology. You know, we, we did an assessment of all the different building research avenues we could pursue and where the needs are, and that is most definitely an area that still needs progression. You know, you can look at lighting technology and you could see tremendous advances over the past decade. You look at heating and cooling technology and how it's being deployed in New York and, and again, even across the country, and it has not advanced at all to the degree that we need it to advance. And the technology hasn't advanced um, as, as well, so that's a very important area. Innovation, capacity, and business development. We want to work with entrepreneurs in New York in the clean energy area and make them successful. We want them to grow here. We want them to deliver new solutions to, to the marketplace. As we look to our R&D program in the future, we will learn from what we have done over the past number of years. We will be focusing more intensely on tech to market strategies. So when we look at the title of the agenda here, lab to market, we're, we're keen, we will be keenly focused on that in, in the future. The technologies need to work, they need to make it into the marketplace. Doesn't mean we can't make some long term high risk bets, but we've got to get the technologies into the marketplace. We'll be employing more rigorous portfolio management in our R&D program as we go forward and we will be more focused and targeted. So that's an overview of the major portfolios in the Clean Energy Fund. It's an ambitious undertaking and uh, we hope to have more to report by the year's end uh, in terms of the Public Service Commission feedback and, and uh, approval. So what does this mean in terms of some concrete things that we will be doing or we are doing? And I've identified a few here. Um, we will be launching a $20 million clean energy business model competition to attract and grow entrepreneurs to New York's southern tier. Um, and I think that does provide an opportunity for a number of partnerships with the central New York region, be it in supply chain, be it in innovation area. We are launching what we're calling the Rev Campus Challenge, and this is something I really like the university here to, to engage with and pay attention to. And this is a $3 million clean energy competition and recognition program for New York's colleges and, and universities. Uh, and we have also just launched an affordable solar initiative. And, and this is really an important um, element of our strategies going forward. As we look to accelerate this clean energy industry and increase penetration of clean energy in our society, we we can't leave low to moderate income consumers behind. Um, this cannot just be technology that people who have surplus cash can, can afford to buy. So we are advancing a number of strategies to try to make it easier for low to moderate income sectors to engage and support clean energy and experience the benefits of solar energy in particular. So it's an important element of our strategies going forward. Um, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that we have going on in central New York, and these, these are activities that are underway. And again, I put these up here really more for illustrative purposes of the kinds of things that we are doing and we expect to be doing into the future. We do have three community grid uh, demonstrations going on right now, and we call that our New York Prize initiative, and some of you may be engaged in that. We're working with 
the city of Syracuse, Oswego, and Syracuse near the west side on these feasibility studies. And we're hopeful that some of these will move forward to, to full implementation. We, we have a couple of projects with the center here, uh, the microenvironmental control system work, which is jointly funded with ARPA-E, and I presume we'll hear more about that over the course of the day. I won't talk to you about that one. And we are certainly partners in the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Accelerator here as well. Um, l lastly, we've had a great partnership with the, the Clean Tech Center at Tech Garden, and I, this is one of the six clean energy incubators that we have across New York State, and it's a very successful incubator that's graduated uh, many clean energy companies, and we, we hope it certainly continues to do so. So those are just some uh, more concrete examples of the kinds of things uh, we are doing in clean energy, the kinds of things that we'll need to be doing more of as we pursue this, this clean energy future. So clearly our goals are, are quite ambitious. Um, and just to underscore, you know, we will only be able to achieve this vision if we have the full engagement of the public and the private sector and communities and, and institutions uh, throughout New York State. So, you know, with that, we very much look forward to your partnership. Um, I look forward to your feedback. Um, you can feel free to contact us at any of those uh, points. Uh, you, can, you can reach me as well. And I hope you have a productive balance of today. So thank you very much. Janet, has time for questions? So how about, I'm going to ask the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so first, thank, thank you for your presentation, and thanks for your, uh, your leadership. Um, so I have a, a, a high-level question about the, the nexus of uh, technology, innovation, policy, and communications. So you've art articulated the goals in the framework of uh, specific targets in 2030. Mm -hmm. And the state's energy plan actually looks out ahead to 2050 and has even higher goals. So 80% reduction in greenhouse gas in 2050. The, how does one balance uh, in communications to the public? It's like, th does the public have an appetite that you can only look ahead to 2030? And, and that if you looked ahead to 2050, it would be too far in the future. But you were hinting at technologies that are needed to hit the 2050 goal, and in particular, renewable uh, heating and cooling. So that's, that's a technology that will be needed to hit the 2050 goal, but might not be needed to hit the 2030 goal. So, so just this question of the, the goals presented to the public are in that context of 2030, but there's, there's more goals yet to come. Okay, great question. I, I knew you'd have a hard one, Ed. Um, so I guess a couple of things. Uh, first of all, you, you're, you're correct. When we talk about 2050 to the public at large, that's irrelevant. That, that's too far in the future. One of the things that our governor, I think, has been very good at driving is if we're going to lay out 2030 goals or 2050 goals, I want to know what you're going to do in the next three years. I want to know what you're going to do in the next five years. What are we going to do in the next 10 years? So I think as we communicate these longer term aspirational goals, we have to communicate the progress that we're making in the near term, because that's what people understand. So we can't just be aspirational. So if we're talking about you know, net zero energy buildings, we better be talking about ways to reduce your energy 20, your building energy use 20, 30, 40% today with the technology that's here and now. So I guess my, my short answer to that is we have to work on both time frames. 
and make sure we can put enough concrete examples of what's happening in the near term that's moving us toward that longer term aspirational goal. Thank you very much, Jim. Yes, I'm going to ask, ask you to use the microphone. <laughs> At the beginning of the and you said that capacity utilization in New York is 54%. Yeah. Uh, solar and wind have a capacity utilization of about 30%. If you go to 50% reliance on solar and wind and intermittent sources, what will that do to the capacity utilization of the entire system? And how do we plan to balance mm -hmm. this with uh, base load? Right. Okay, so that, that is one of the central questions that our Public Service Commission is looking at as part of our REV regulatory proceeding. It's also a question that our New York independent system operator, which controls our bulk power flow, is looking at right now. Um, I, a couple of pieces of, uh, a couple of comments on that. So one of the ways of increasing our capacity utilization is to figure out how to reduce the peak of those 100 hours a year which we design our system for. So how do we reduce that peak? Well, there's, there's load reduction, there's electric load reduction, which we can do today through control technology. There's load shifting, which we can do today. There's combinations of solar and energy storage. So those are some things that we can do today to reduce that peak. Um, when we look toward 2030, we still see a role for base load power. We don't, we can't envision the system that works without base load power, you know, and whether that's um, zero carbon nuclear or, uh, you know, combined cycle, combined cycle natural gas that has quick ramping capabilities, I would expect those will need to be part of this future. When we start talking about, I, and I'll add one other thing, heard a great presentation uh, two weeks ago from the Vice President for Engineering at the New York Independent System Operator. And what he said was, today um, load follows demand. Tomorrow, demand will follow load. Um, so what it gets to is a system that has much more dynamic communications and dynamic controls. But there is no doubt when we start talking about 50% renewable resources in our grid with intermittent production, we need to start thinking about how we balance that, be it storage, be it uh, a buffer of hydro from, from Canada, be it quick uh, control and aggregation of load shifting, load leveling. You know, so it's that total, it's that portfolio of actions that we're going to need to keep our grid, our grid stable. So it's it's not a trivial engineering challenge. It it's really not. So currently we have uh, an initiative which we refer to as Renewable Heat New York, and we are trying to advance efficient and clean biomass heating systems for consumers in New York State. <clears throat> and the goal there, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the goal there is to really um, drive down the cost of high performance clean systems. There are ways to do, thanks Ed, there are ways to do biomass combustion wrong and you know we, we've seen those systems and there are ways to make this clean and efficient. You know the Austrians, the Germans, they have figured out how to do biomass heating at residential and commercial sites combined with solar store, solar thermal combined with thermal storage 
in a way that really works. So that's one of our high priority areas for, for biomass. John? Uh, hello, on a similar note, <laughs> On a similar note, um, is there a goal for improving the load profile of the state and by how much, what savings that might represent and how many power plants we won't need as a result? I'm going to defer to my to the Public Service Commission and my colleagues at, at, at DPS who are working at, on that now. Um, oh, I don't have this number off the top of my head, but it's, it's I, there is um, an analysis of if we were to reduce the 100 peak hours a year that, that I referred to a few times, the savings have a B in front of it, okay? I don't remember exactly what it is, but, but the magnitude is quite significant. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. I'm very glad to see uh, all the programs that you have. Uh, but to move the needle that you're talking about is going to take much more effort than what is apparent. I'm glad you talked a little bit about storage, which is critical, but I did not hear you talk about transmission. And transmission, particularly from energy rich upstate New York mm -hmm. to the New York City area, seems to me that is a sine qua non to increase renewables in the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, follow up on that is, uh, you, although you did speak about combined cycle, I did not hear you talk about cogeneration or tri-generation, particularly in the big cities, which to move the needle on the energy efficiency, it's absolutely required. Mm -hmm. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tra transmission is unequivocally, upgrades in our transmission is unequivocally required to achieve our 50% goal. And again, I'll defer to, to the New York independent system operator who just presented that you know, two weeks ago. Um, advances in energy storage are required and more on-site cogeneration as well as tri-generation will be a cost-effective way to increase customer energy efficiency. Uh, the question would be about uh, the Fitzpatrick closing and whether that <laughs> helps or hurts uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Well, taking zero carbon baseload power out of our electric mix unequivocally makes it harder to achieve our greenhouse gas goals. So is the, is the state going to look at trying to, I guess philosophically, should a private company take what is a state and natural resource offline? They came at huge expense, um, replicate, they're carbon free, and uh, you know, a private entity is taking it offline, and one could argue hurting, you know, the entire thing. Yeah. So we are actively looking at that issue right now, looking at all options, looking at costs, looking at the impact on the local economy. It should be on. You can stand up. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for a great presentation. I do research in combustion. And so I have not heard anything that touches my area. <laughs> and, and, and those of us, those of us who, who do research in combustion, we are looking at different numbers. And we're a little bit afraid that you're selling to the public what will not be realized in 30 years. Uh, right now around the country, we have about 80% of our energy coming from, uh, from, uh, from combustion. In 1980, that number was about 98%. Uh, what is the miracle that will move us in the next 30 years from 80% to lower than 50%? Uh, frankly, we are not optimistic about that. So we would like to see the state have a, break, uh, a greater engagement with combustion technologies. And I'll give you an example. One of the lowest efficiency areas is transportation. So mm -hmm. people in upstate 
if you use a train, the efficiency goes up. If you use a car, the efficiency is much lower. Mm -hmm. So we're wondering why the state is not um, raising such issues as having a train from Sy Syracuse to New York at much regular intervals, where that will have a much greater impact on the carbon footprint of the state. Yeah, so uh, transportation improvements are a big part of our energy of future. If you look at the greenhouse gas contributions from that sector, it's more than from the electric sector. To make changes in the transportation system often gets into complex um, federal jurisdictional issues. It gets into interstate issues that just all need to be all need to be worked out. So we have to make improvements in the transportation system. Agreed. In terms of combustion. We do see base load power as part of our future, and we expect that will be n natural gas as, as part of our future. In terms of where the miracles occur, we're going to look to our universities for those miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good note to end on the miracles. <laughs> uh uh, around that point too, uh, about the university, uh, I didn't see much uh, support for research at the university geared towards training students to come with these bright ideas. Uh, among the areas listed that will receive support, I was trying to figure out where can I get support from the, from, from the pot. And it did not really come across as if uh, it would be possible, unless I am trying to develop a technology myself, but we are talking about very complex systems where you need over 100 people to be collaborating to realize that. So is there really um, going to be an option uh, to support research that is at a very small lab scale, where the first, the first focus is not for us to come up with a product, it's to understand the physics, and then we can allow uh, the commercial sector to take that knowledge forward. Okay. A couple of, again, really good good questions. So we do envision as part of our future innovation portfolio, we will continue to be working with universities in New York State. And when we talk about working with universities and research universities, we are talking about working with, with students, right? We're to, who, what, what's the labor that universities use? It's students. So we will be Im implicitly training students through this effort going forward. I indicated that we're very focused on getting technology into the market, but that we are not going to shy away from making higher risk, higher bet, longer term investments, which means a level of technology risk. Now, will we become a basic research entity? No. You know, we, we're not National Science Foundation, and that's not our niche. So, you know, understanding basic physics phenomena. We probably won't be there working with entities like Syracuse University to develop and test something out at a lab scale and build a prototype at the lab. We will be there. Hi. Uh, question about, we've, uh, so I work at Syracuse Center of Excellence. We have a, help a lot of companies um, and researchers with applying to these ponds that you have. Um, with the Clean Energy Fund, uh, how will that process change? Um, do you anticipate that we're going to see less of the ponds and more of that tech to market um, shifting, or are they going to be just in parallel? Um, we will continue to be using different types of solicitations or program opportunity notices into the future. We expect to be incorporating tech-to-market strategies within those uh, solicitations. And again, Joe Borowick, who heads up our buildings team, is working right now on some redesign of how we interact with, with the market and with universities in terms of those solicitation uh, vehicles. So Janet, Janet wanted to end on miracles and took two more questions <laughs> after that. So I'm going to thank Janet for okay. her presentation. <laughs>